Hello everybody. So welcome back to our explorations of the English Romantic writer 1798 to 1832. In the last session we spoke about empire and orientalism and we had a brief review of romanticism, the empire and the other. Today we continue that. We have a whole bunch of texts, fiction, non-fiction, narrative poems, drama produced around the theme of empire. We can start with Samuel Johnson's Rasselas, 1759, John Hawksworth's text of 1761, Almoran and Hammett, um, Lesser known texts, of course. Uh, the more famous ones are William Beckford's Vathek, 1786, uh, Phoebe Gibbs' Hartley House, Calcutta, which is traditionally taken to be the first Anglo Indian novel. Uh, by Anglo Indian novel, we speak here of novels by Britishers set in British India. Uh, and the first such novel has been traced. For a long time, we didn't know the name of the author, Hartley House, Calcutta, 1789. Uh, and now we have discovered that the author was actually Phoebe Gibbs. Uh, Elizabeth Hamilton's translation of the letters of a Hindu Raja. Then there are narrative poems such as Robert Sadi's Thalaba the Destroyer and the Curse of Kahama, Thomas Moore's Lala Rook. We'll take it in stages as to how the empire occurs in the, so in the social and literary imagination of England. Our first stop here is empire and orientalism and the commodified other. The vocabulary of foreign things we see in English writing shows us the extent of England's trade connections, but also the cultural consumption of the other. Now, I am thinking of this in two ways. One, the actual arrival of commodities in England, so tea, coffee, tobacco, and all those other things, um, including cloth and muslin, but also that these products feel the way the literature about the East is produced. So it's a two-way interaction. Together, we put it under the category, the cultural consumption of the other. So there is the consumption in terms of artifacts and tokens in the Victorian parlor every day objects, tea, sugar, coffee, tobacco, which come from elsewhere. And this, as somebody put it, uh, James Watt writes, the growth of an ethnocentric confidence in Eng Britain's essential superiority over its East and others. If you want to know how this was put together, you can see an instance in John Keats's uh, poem, The Eve of St. Agnes. And here is a description. A heap of candied apples, quins and plum and gourd with jelly soother than the creamy curd, and lucent syrups tinct with cinnamon, manna and dates in Argosy transferred from fez and spiced dainties every one from silk and Samarkand to cedar to Lebanon. Take a look at this. You will see parallels with um, The Rape of the Lock, Alexander Pope's poem, where also there's a categorization and an inventory of things which have come from different parts of the world. John Keats is the eve of St. Agnes is doing pretty much the same thing. William Cooper, um, treats tea, which did not originate in England, please understand, and the ritual of tea drinking as a marker of quiet English domesticity. In, for example, a poem, the long poem, The Task, 1785, Cooper would paint a picture of such warm English domesticity entirely in connection with tea drinking. Here is a description of Cooper's uh, tea drinking ritual as a marker of Englishness coming up on your slide now. Now stir the fire and close the shutters fast. Let fall the curtains, wheel the sofa around, and while the bubbling and loud hissing urn throws up a steamy column, and the cups that cheer but are not inebriate, wait on each, so let us welcome peaceful evening in. What's Cooper doing? Cooper is suggesting that Englishness, true English identity, depends on tea drinking. Now surely you should see the irony here. True English identity depends upon the consumption of a thing which never came from England itself. It's a reinstatement of a restatement of Edward Said's argument in Orientalism that Europe could only construct itself when there was a racial and cultural other. So think of this, Cooper who argues that English identity is defined by tea drinking, English domesticity is defined by tea drinking, is making the argument that the English domestic scene is possible with the presence of a foreign product, tea. Coleridge would also see tea as the centerpiece of quiet English domesticity. Coming up on your slide now, a few lines from Coleridge's poem, Monody on a Tea Kettle. Delightful tea, with thee compared what yields the maddening wine, sweet power, who knows to spread the calm delight and the pure joy prolonged to midmost night. So the teapot itself becomes a sign of English identity, but in a slightly different sense. On the walls of the teapot, says Joanna Bailey, another poet, quote, in distant nations' manners we behold. 
So the tea vessel becomes synecdechic of a culture and the means of English culture's association with an acquisition of knowledge. The teapot has, and the tea of course, has journeyed from somewhere and is now seen in England's, Britain's polished land, as she puts it. The teapot becomes a star attraction at tea time. And here is an excerpt from the poem for you. The point to be noted here is, tea is incorporated into the English thinking about itself. Tea, cocoa, coffee, sugarcane are re-assimilated into England as part of its identity. But there were other products as well. In Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, published in 1814, Lady Bertram wants her nephew William, at the start of his naval career, to go to the East Indies. And why does she want him to go? Her reason is very simple, that I may have a shawl. I think I will have two shawls. So the purpose of the nephew going abroad is to bring her things from various parts of the world. And here is a list. China, tapestries, cotton clothing, Kashmiri shawls constitute, as we can see from these texts, signs of privilege, class, and modernity, and are instruments of self-fashioning. And that's the point I was making. Europe can only fashion itself with the arrival and consumption of these other things from various parts of the world. In Chance Lamb's essay, Old China, the China vessels signify um, social mobility. Displaying the other object in some form or the other was a prominent mode of appropriating the other. You, you make it your own. So that's roughly the commodity part of romantic orientalism. We now move on to other things. The Oriental Tale, inaugurated by Samuel Johnson in Rasalas. In the Oriental Tale, we can identify these following themes. It represents the Asians as plunderers, superstitious, unreliable people. It might kill off the Asian. It may suggest, but not necessarily carry through the possibility of cross-cultural encounter or liaison of uh, British men cohabiting with native women, for example. The implication that British rules, the British rule was good for India. That's something that is that works through as a trope in most of the texts. Then, of course, the depiction of women in many of these um, texts. The Curse of Kahama, Robert Sadi's longish narrative poem, is an extravagant Gothic epic about a wicked Hindu Raja, a wicked Hindu Raja, or would be emperor of the world, and an Eastern alter ego of Napoleon Bonaparte. It symbolizes Hinduism itself as something uh, a religion cruel in its ideas and relatively despotic in its practice. Now, one of the things you will realize about Romantic Orientalism is many of the evils of the, of the subcontinent were traced to the bad religions, in most cases Hinduism itself. Then you see the emergence of an imperial Gothic. Charles Maturin's Melmoth the Wanderer, 1820, Charlotte Dacre's Zofloya, about whom we had a little mention in the previous session, uh, Walter Scott's The Surgeon's Daughter. The imperial Gothic draws upon the Gothic tradition, and you do know what the Gothic is. It was interested in the dark side of emotions. It was interested in things like madness. It was also interested in questions of class and power. Adapting that to the imperial, mapping the imperial onto the Gothic, you receive the, you get to see the imperial Gothic itself. And the themes would include illicit desire, um, the desire of people for each other outside marriage, for example. Demonic temptation, which is a favorite theme. Evil Asians, um, you will see this occurring as late as the 20th century in the work of, say, someone like Arthur Conan Doyle, where the evil Asian is there somewhere, uh, uh, out there somewhere to get you. Then, of course, the theme of the possible ruin of the English by the natives, that once the natives begin coming in, there will be a problem. You will see this most exquisitely portrayed in the Moonstone, where uh, it's the arrival of the stone in England that produces unhappiness and, um, and tensions. In other words, the foreign out there is okay, but the foreign when it comes in becomes a problem. So Romantic Orientalism was fascinated by the other, but did not want to incorporate the other, shall we say. So there is this tension between wanting something out there, liking it, but also discovering that Oh, once they come in, there's a problem. So everything that happens in the moonstone is attributed finally to the presence of this Indian stone. The Indian stone is something stolen uh, 
from the siege of uh, uh, Tipu Sultan and at Seringapatnam. And the stone supposedly is taken by somebody and goes to England. And once it enters the household, everything goes bad. So even a stone from India has a certain um, agency, shall we say. So Romantic Orientalism is this huge swath of texts, interested in uh, gender, interested in class, interested in commodities. But ultimately, they come together to demonstrate that um, the East can be seen in certain ways. And that is important because whether it's the Imperial Gothic or the Lyrical Ballads of England, um, published in 1798 for the first time, you do see the sense of the exotic, but you also know, you also know that there is a lot of unhappiness that goes on in those kinds of representations. Thank you.